Good afternoon. Welcome to Smithsonian Gardens. Let's talk gardens. We're so excited to have you here with us today. We enjoy your company and we know that you're going to learn some valuable information from our speaker today. Shelly Gaskins is a horticulturist in the Rose Garden, in the Smithsonian Gardens Rose Garden, and you're in for a treat. Shelly has done so much research and found out so much on different ways to make our Rose Garden beautiful and sustainable. So today, if you do have questions, please put them in the chat box. We'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation, and we will post them on our website. This, web, this uh, webinar will be posted on our website next week, and along with the questions and answers that we don't get to today. So without further ado, Shelly Gaskins, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being part of Let's Talk Gardens. You look like you're in a rose garden today. How appropriate. Thank you for that too. So I'm gonna go ahead and disappear. I'd like you to tell people who you are beyond what I did and why you got started in the rose garden and then jump into your presentation, please. Thank you so much. I'll see you at the end of your presentation. Okay, thank you, Cindy. I just, um, I'm, I'm Shelly Gaskins, as Cindy said, and I have um, been working with Smithsonian Gardens for the last 20 years. Um, probably 18 of those in the Rose Garden. Um, and it has been uh, my pleasure to work here and also an honor to work for such an amazing institution and doing something I love. And it's not lost on me that I am pretty lucky. Um, I started working in the Rose Garden uh, when I was a very young horticulturist uh, because uh, one of our horticulturists left and they needed someone to um, take over in an inner arm. And I took over and loved it and thankfully they let me keep doing it. So um, this is, it has been an, an, an act of love in this rose garden and also um, a challenge um, to meet my personal values um, in, in this garden. So um, I just start there. That's where this earth friendly rose garden um, comes from. Have you ever heard the phrase, um, have your cake and eat it too? This is like something my mom was always saying, figure out a way to have your cake and eat it too. And according to the Cambridge Dictionary, this means to have and uh, or do two good things at the same time that are impossible to have and do at the same time. Um, and in this case, that's beautiful roses and an earth friendly garden, right? This is, this is something that is something we're talking about now, but hasn't always been something that we could see together. So first I want to say, um, what do I mean by a sustainable or earth friendly garden? Because this is, again, this is something that is part of the conversation now and it can include a lot of things like water conservation and uh, fossil fuel uh, energy use and, and, and reduction and composting. And I mean, there's a number of things that, that would be on topic of sustainable gardening, but this we're looking through the lens of a rose garden and what I'm going to talk about are plant selection, garden design and cultural practices. So this is the Catherine Fuller, uh, Gulen Folger Rose Garden. This is, the, this is literally the lens that I will be looking through. Um, this garden was designed and installed originally in 1998 as a uh, four season garden that showcased modern roses. Um, this, if, for those of you who haven't visited, we are looking out the door of the Smithsonian Castle and at the Arts and Industries Building. Um, and this, photograph was taken uh, years ago. Um, and I, I just want to draw your attention to the turf panel that's back, that's back over here. Because when I talk about the um, redesign of the garden and the expansion, this is the place of expansion. But this is the place where I heard what uh, visitors thought about roses. And what our visitors thought about roses were that roses were pretty, but they, the new ones, they don't have any fragrance. Or roses are pretty, but they require too many chemicals, too many pesticides. Um, or roses are pretty, but they're, they're too fussy. They're too, they're, they're too hard to garden. And those things I knew were not true. Um, and, and I was looking for opportunities to, to meet those myths and, and um, debunk them. 
so when the talk of uh, redesigning the garden came up, at first I wasn't totally on board because I had been loving those roses since, since I began working in that rose garden. But there, it became obvious to me that there were some things going on. Um, and the truth about the garden in 2015 was that we had a disease in the soil, which was called Southern blight that had, that was knocking down all the um, plant diversity. Like most of the perennials could not survive in the soil with this high level of Southern blight. Um, we had a broken irrigation system and, and Southern blight is a fungus. So a broken irrigation system that was dumping water into it was not helping the situation. Uh, and then we had these big overgrown hollies in the middle, um, which when they were installed were perfectly sized and then they grew like plants do. And then they were kind of taking up the space that was supposed to be for roses and blocking the building behind it. And then the worst thing of all was that the roses were declining and I really um, felt like I was failing until I read an article in American Rose Magazine that said, um, it's not your fault. <laughs> and it, what it was getting at there was that um, grafted roses that are 20 years old um, often decline and that's just, that's normal for grafted roses, which many of us think, well, roses, you know, they live a long, long time and they do. Um, especially if they're on their own route. And this will come up again, but the fact that the roses were declining and the soil was diseased, that the, this, uh, this need for uh, renovation um, was obvious even to me. <laughs> so in 2016, um, we, made, um, we made the request and the Folger family supported the idea of expanding and um, renovating the Rose Garden, uh, which included new soil, new roses, uh, new irrigation system. And then also the expansion was, if you can see my cursor here, this, these areas were not part of the original rose garden. The original rose garden was just this smaller area. So we then took this part. So this part uh, up against the building is the expansion. It actually increased the size of the garden from 5,000 square feet to 10,000 square feet. Um, and the new rose garden the design idea was this, is that I would meet this myth of roses don't smell anymore by adding a scent gallery, putting roses that had higher um, known fragrance in this area, and that roses are too fussy and they require too many chemicals would be in this area that, where I would showcase roses in a functioning landscape, right? So in 2016, again, we, we, dug, we dug out the soil down to 18 inches, put in new soil in the, in the bed that was the existing rose garden that had the disease in it, got all new roses, all new irrigation, um, all new perennials. And then this is what it looked like the first year. And then the second year, the perennials really start to grow um, and it, you could hardly tell it was a rose garden, but then by the third year, the roses came up, up to, a, to a height there where you could see them above the perennials. Um, that's my only fancy slide for you guys. <laughs> Um, and this, the, you know, as it is a rose garden, one of the most important things you can think about is which, um, what roses are you going to put in there? And that's, it's an exciting proposition and there are so many to choose from. It can be daunting, um, especially if you want to, you want to choose the right one. You know, you don't want to just choose it because it has the same name as you or the same name as someone you love. You want to, you want to choose it because it, it, its value um, is, is more is bigger than its name, right? So you have to have some sort of criteria. And the criteria that I chose was that I wanted them to be on their own roots. I wanted them to be disease resistant. I wanted them to be continuous bloomers because it is right in front of a building and it's not it's not a huge rose garden. So it I needed the, the I need the most bang for my buck. Um, and then the other things like color, fragrance, size, and year of introduction, those were all secondary to them being own root disease resistant and um, continuous blooming. So when I talk about own root, um, just it, it seems like it's very obvious once I say it, but it, it seems confusing because maybe some people don't know that you can, you could in the past and you still can now buy grafted roses. And that's fine. There are lots of reasons why growers would grow grafted roses. They can grow more roses faster if they do it this way. And that is grafting the rose that you want onto a, like a hardy rootstock, uh, 
a vigorous party rootstock, which um, can be things like Multiflora rose or Dr. Huey. Um, they can get more roses, like an 18 month turnaround period for the grower with a grafted rose versus a own root rose or one here with no graft joint as this in, image is showing you, it takes the grower about three years and it's a smaller plant, but it's hardy, it is the same all the way down. So if it were to freeze down to the ground, the rose would come back from its roots as itself versus over here, this one, if the rose top gets mowed off, heaven forbid, or freezes to the ground, what comes back is the rootstock, which is not the rose that you chose, and is kind of like a, it's just a wild rose. It blooms once, and it's, you know, it doesn't have the growth habit habit you chose. Um, so, grafted roses are definitely still available in the trade, and there are some roses that you can't get own root. But again, I said this is my criteria for narrow, narrowing it down. Um, so all my roses are own root. And then they were also chosen for their reported disease resistance. Um, and um, disease resistance varies uh, throughout throughout the country or throughout the world even. It's like there are strains of black spot that vary from location to location. What is highly disease resistant, resistant in Texas or California or Washington DC it, it, it varies because the, the strains of black spot are different. So while you can choose by, you know, it says disease resistant in the catalog, the best way to find out about disease resistance is to talk to uh, your local public gardens or your local row societies, because they can tell you what is in fact showing disease resistance in your area. So the number one disease uh, most common for roses is black spot. And I, I, work in the gardens and people are always coming in and telling me that all the leaves fell off their off their plants and and they don't know why they some sometimes they think it was an insect or mother thing and most commonly if the leaves fell off it's probably black spot and there are um, some indicators before they fall off um, that they get this yellow halo and sometimes the leaves just turn yellow they get the black spots and then ultimately they fall off although sometimes they don't always fall off they just hang around with black spot on them so that is the number one uh, problem with, as far as disease resistance goes. And then another one that happens mostly here in the spring, it's mostly something I see in the spring is, is powdery mildew. And I and just tell you the first time I saw it's uh, very early symptoms, which are blistering distortions and a purpling and curling of the leaves. I didn't know what it was because I knew powdery mildew looked like this powdery. I didn't know it like, you know, deformed the leaves a little bit. Um, so it, I was happy to find out that it was just this very common powdery mildew uh, disease that I had. And that also it here, I get it mostly in the cooler, uh, in the cooler months. And then by midsummer, I, I don't have an issue with it. So those are the, that's the disease resistance that I'm trying to fight by choosing these roses. Um, and these are the roses that I can say in the Folger Rose Garden have been showing great disease resistance. And one of my favorites is Plum Perfect. Plum Perfect is a Cortez rose and this, this Cortez rose, it's a Cortez family. They're the family of, um, they're a family in Germany that have been growing roses for years, um, generations even. Um, and they, started a breeding program without using um, fungicides. And that meant that their roses were coming out as being very disease resistant. So Plum Perfect, I think uh, came out in 1997 um, and I just adore this rose. And when, it's often one of the ones that I say is my favorite because it's Plum Perfect. Another really wonderful performing rose in the rose garden is Yellow Submarine. Um, and it shows great disease resistance, flowers profusely. Um, it, one of my favorite things about it though, is there was this gentleman who asked me, if, oops, excuse me, if there was a uh, place he could get this rose. And I was like, of course it's available. And you know, it's, it's modern rose, it's available in the trade now. I was like, why do you love the beetles? And he said, no, I, I drive a submarine. And I thought, that's cool. You never know, you know, why someone is drawn to something, but you're drawn, drawn to a disease resistance rose 
resistant rows, then more power to you. This is uh, Belinda's dream. Uh, now I just, I, I love how it looks with the pine trees. It's surprising to me uh, for some reason that what a, what a wonderful combination it is with the, um, with the pine tree. And it is an, an earth kind rose. And this, this is a designation that's given by the Texas Agro, Agro Life Extension. They did extensive re research across the country to find out which roses showed disease resistance in many parts of the country. Um, and that they, that they had disease resistance and high landscape value. And Belinda's dream is beautiful. This is lemon fizz. If you're ever looking to add some brightness to your garden, it's some fizz. <laughs> this is the way to do it. This was uh, new to me last year, I believe, and it is just viewing wonderfully. It's beautiful, glossy foliage and this bright, bright yellow rose. If, if hybrid tea roses were your thing, the, that if it, if it like lemon fizz doesn't look like a rose to you, but this looks like a rose to you, this is a hybrid tea called Wedding Bells. And it is, I mean, the, well, you can see it. It's hard to, it's hard to compete with a, with a, um, a photo of Wedding Bells. It's also a Cordes family rose. Um, and, and it has, it's fragrant, four feet tall, three feet wide. This is what is considered to be a ground cover rose. It's one of the drift roses. You can get these just about anywhere. Um, I have two in the garden now. Uh, the one you see here on the left is popcorn drift. And then I also have peach drift. And a, kind of a cool thing about this is that popcorn drift was a sport, meaning it just came, there was a, po there was a peach drift and then it had a branch that was just yellow. So they started propagating that, vegetatively propagating that, and that became popcorn drift. Um, so I have peach drift and popcorn drift, and I've always wanted an apricot drift, but it always seems to be sold out. Um, but that, uh, that is a very beautiful um, drift rose. The ground cover is two feet tall by two feet wide. So, you know, not a ground cover like we think of it. We're completely ground hugging, but just not a very tall rose. This is cream veranda, and it's just such an elegant little rose. Also, a Cordes family rose, um, two to three feet tall by three to feet, three to uh, four feet wide. Tequila is is probably one of my favorites, and I could tell because of so many. I had so many pictures of it. This color looks perfect with the arts and industries building behind it. You see that here, um, and it. It, it blooms so much. It, it doesn't have perfect disease resistance. I, it, I have seen it defoliate some and then refoliate, um, but the color is, it's so many colors and it is, it is one of my favorites. This is Tupelo Honey and it is like, you'll see this is tequila back here behind it, some purple rain. High performing rose, um, also a Cordes family rose, three to four feet uh, tall by two to three feet wide, moderate fragrance. Loxy. Loxy is a miniature rose with so with, with like with a big personality, like this strong, strong color, great disease resistant. I, right now I have just two miniatures in the garden, and this is the only one I would tell you about. The other one is won't probably stay because it's disease resistant it is not being proven thus far. Um, and though I do plan to get more Roxy for the garden. I have an area that is uh, in a part of the expansion area is in some shade. So I spent some time trying to find out, um, trying to find some roses that would tolerate shade. And um, um, Mutabilist is one of those. It's sometimes called the butterfly rose. It is a really old rose. It was, um, available in 1894, so it's an old rose. It's also one of the earth kind roses, like I said, with the Texas AgriLife Extension um, designation of an earth kind rose. Uh, and it shows some it's shade tolerance, doing fine over there. It's 
cold hardiness goes to about zone seven, which is what we are. So colder climates may not be able to grow this as easily, uh, but it's doing great here. In that same um, light shade area is this rose cloud quietness, which I also have in full sun, and it's doing it's doing great in both in both locations. Uh, quietness was a Griffith Buck rose, which was, he was a Dr. Griffith Buck. He was a horticulture professor at Iowa State University. Um, he bred like over eighty cultivars and having really um, cold hardiness, like negative twenty. Like that, but they all had to show disease resistance um, and quietness. This, I mean, this image of it with this beautiful foliage. I, I know it got some black spot last year, but it is definitely a keeper. I'm, I'm going to keep it in the rows in the, in the garden. And this pearl viora is also in that light shade area. Uh, it's a polyantha, but last year it rose to my favorite rose. It last year when I couldn't be in the garden as often as I normally am, am due to the pandemic, this rose did fine. It didn't need, it didn't need, need me to be there. It was just so beautiful. Every time I went, it was just that it was there to welcome me back. So I probably are, became certainly one of my favorites. And then I would be remiss if I did not tell you about rose rosette disease and tell you to look out for it because this is the biggest threat to our garden roses is rose rosette. And it is spread by a mite. And once you have the, once you have the disease, you need to remove the plant. Um, they do say, and I have done, plant roses back in the same space, um, but you have to remove the plant. Some people try cutting it out and because it, it's a virus, it actually lives in the, in the, in the blood, if you will, of the plant. So you can't cut it out. You have to re you have to remove the plant, and it the indications of it is this very very thorny fast growth growth, and it's not just red growth, but red growth is part of it. But many roses have um, new growth that's red. So red's not enough. It has to be red, and then also have insane amounts of thorns. And then this also this kind of, it's called the witch's broom. Um, this mass of curled up small foliage that's that's um, kind of gnarly, a telltale sign of it. And I know in my in my neighborhood where I live, I walk around and it is everywhere. And I I don't feel like enough people recognize it. And I want you guys to be the ones who can recognize it and know what you're supposed to do. You, you need to remove that plant and not put it in your compost pile. It needs to go into a bag into the garbage. So off that note and into this good note. So then, so we've talked about um, choosing the right roses and then this idea of the garden that's gonna support those roses. Um, to make the distinction here, like the difference between monoculture and polyculture, monoculture is like agriculture, like all corn or the way we used to do rose gardens um, indicated this lovely little slide here that comes from the Smithsonian Gardens Archives of American Gardens. Um, rose gardens were exclusively roses. Sometimes they would have like a boxwood hedge, but this is an example of monoculture. And when you have monoculture, you have all the buildup of all, all, all rose problems, you know, like all the diseases and all the pests that, that roses, that love roses will be there because you have nothing but roses versus polyculture, which brings in the biodiversity, um, which plant diversity equals insect diversity. So this is an example. What I want to talk about is um, biodiversity or polyculture. And you get to that from companion planting. And compa companion planting can be done for a number of reasons. And it's done in, in, our, in our gardens at home, but it's done in vegetable gardens. It's done um, in agricultural fields. But it's done mostly for pest control or, or providing habitat for beneficial insects. That's how I'm using it. But it can also be for pollination, maximizing use of space, and increasing crop productivity. But with regard to pest control and, and providing habitat, this is one thing you have to you have to know first is that our beneficial insects, of which this is a green lacewing, this is a beneficial insect, and it's beneficial to, to me as a rose gardener because it eats the pests that like roses. It needs not just 
it feeds on the pest, yes, but it also feeds on pollen and nectar in different parts of its life cycle. So you have to understand that you have to provide the pollen and nectar for them when they're not eating your pest. So the, the lace, and this, I love these eggs. I hope you I hope you can see what they are. They're on this little skinny little filament um, and there's the egg and they're so, they're a general predator and they're so voracious. They're on this little filament, right? So, so that when they come out, they're not, they're not normally close together. This is just for the image. They would be by themselves and they're off by themselves so that they don't, don't eat each other. <laughs> um, and to uh, the predator that, that eats our aphids and mealybugs, um, the he has little snappers and there's the cocoon. And if you need help remembering that, here's a nice cartoon by one of our plant health interns, Escher. They created this comic to uh, help us remember our beneficial insects. And I don't know how many of you remember Cagney and Lacey, but I do, and I love this. Another great memory trigger for one of the beneficial insects um, in the garden is, is, is this, the minute pirate bug. This is, we do um, feed the garden with beneficial in insects. So we, we purchase them and bring them to the garden and uh, green lacewing and the minute pirate bugs. These are, these are some of the ones that we bring into the garden. And you, see, you can see the minute pirate bug here. I'll never forget the name of the minute pirate bug. So when you're, pro you're providing for the beneficial insects with the pollen and the nectar, and there are plant families that um, provi provide a lot of that. For, and so these are ones that are considered to attract beneficial insects. The, the carrot family, the daisy family, the mustard family, the mint family, buckwheat family, the rose family, <laughs> figwort family, and the verbena family. And I love this quote by William Shakespeare. One touch of nature makes the world kin, makes the whole world kin, right? So, so I just wanted to show you some examples of the companion plants that are in the um, Catherine Doolin Folger Rose Garden. This is uh, the daisy or the aster family. Of course, so we have the asters, Radon's favorite, which in the fall, like it, it gets very tall. And then in, in the case in my garden, because it's not smushed in between other things, it kind of flops over. And then I start to wonder why it's there until it blooms and then I remember. <laughs> um, the Achillea and then this Artemisia Palace Castle. I have two, I have another Artemisia also in the garden that's called Silver Brocade that's more of a ground cover. Um, these are all in the same um, plant family. These are all in the mustard family. Uh, Candy Tuff, which is, they're about to bloom now. Um, this, what's called Basket of Gold or Arrhenia. Is, is it seeds around a little bit. And I love that. I wish it would do it a little bit more. Um, it does not like the heat of the summer. So it kind of melts in the heat of the summertime, but in the early spring, it looks fantastic. And then every, every time I put annuals in the garden, early spring annuals, I, 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 I put in a list and I leave it there all, all summer long. And then it starts to look good again in the fall. And this is ACEs as an added attracting beneficial insects. Another family, the mint family. And there are so many plants that are garden plants that are in the mint family uh, that I have in the garden. This is just a few of them. The Calamantha over here is probably my favorite. It, it occurs to me that many of the plants in the rose garden are plants that would look good in a bouquet with roses. You know, and I don't want I don't choose plants that would compete like, because they compete by having like a big flower or flower the same size, but ones that have little teeny flowers or sprays of flowers look really nice with roses. Um, so this calamantha is probably my favorite and it's throughout the garden and people always ask what is that because it has so many bees on it and everyone now is aware that our pollinators are important, you know, and that they want to know what plant is pulling in that many um, pollinators. So calamantha, a big one. Lavender, everyone's favorite, you know, you can just watch people stroke the lavender in the garden. And uh, I'm always reminding them to, you know, to smell it because it physically relaxes the body to have the, the smell of lavender. And the Russian sage, and this is creeping thyme, which I use as a ground cover in the garden. If you were there to visit, you would probably ask me what it was because it is a very good ground cover in my rose garden because I have, we brought in new soil and it's very well drained soil and um, as 
time as a, as a Mediterranean plant, so it needs a well-drained soil. If it was a heavy soil, I don't imagine it would do as well, but it does great um, in the Folger Rose Garden. So, you know, plants grow and gardeners grow too. So I designed and installed that garden in 2016. And since then the, um, the native pool uh, is, is it's happening. It's happening to me too, and I, I, I want to. I always want to do what's right. This has always been my goal: is to do what's right. Um, so now, in 2019, I put in a couple natives, and there will be more natives put in this year. And the ones that I have already um, are this tiarella, which makes a great ground cover. It requires some shade though, and I do have some shade in the back of a bed, um, and the pentstemum, um, which seeds around a lot. You need, and the seedlings aren't hard to pull up. But if I, I like that it's seeding around because I have space, but if, if you um, just be, be aware that it seeds around and or um, deadhead it before it goes to seed. There are also uh, a number of bulbs in the rose garden. Um, this allium, you know, roses love garlic. I have a couple different kinds of allium. You can see this this one that you see here is the purple sensation. But this this grassy bit will also flower a, a similar flower. Um, this is this is summer beauty. Um, Iris bucarica, which is such a beautiful little plant. I'm surprised I don't see it more. It reminds me of orchids. It's a beautiful thing. It, after it's done flowering, the foliage turns yellow and, and persists for a while, but it's, I think it's well worth it um, for this beautiful display. And then I have a smattering of these little teeny bulbs, um, the scylla and the, um, and the scylla is this little blue or darker blue one. And then this daisy style flowers and an and anemone. An anemone. <laughs> So we talked about the roses, we talked about the companion plantings, and then there are some cultural practices that you can do to, um, to support your garden, right? So one of the most important is to inspect new plants before bringing them in and quarantining them if necessary. This is a lesson that I learned the hard way. You wanna make sure that you don't bring anything into the garden that wasn't already there to begin with. And if you can quarantine it for a while, um, to make sure it doesn't have disease or doesn't have an insect issue, it would be well well worth the time that's spent in quarantine. Um, and then keep a t keep a tidy garden, remove all dead, dying, and diseased plants, and then also their plant parts. So if you do have a rose that um, gets some black spot and then those leaves fall to the ground, you want to pick up those leaves because um, that population of the spores of the black spot are there; they they will increase. If you take them out, it, it decreases the amount of disease pressure in the garden. Use a pop, proper watering technique. You, uh, you, you don't want to ro water roses from the top. So you don't want to just stand there with your hose and, and spray the garden. You want to water roses from the bottom. It does rain, so it's not like they can't stand water on their leaves. It's just um, disease, the fungal disease likes you know, heat and humidity. You keep the humidity down by not spraying the leaves with it, that's going to help um, keep the disease resistance down. And then a lot of people think roses require a lot of fertilizer. They don't. They're, um, they don't require a lot of fertilizer. Maybe more if you're growing roses for a competition to have the single one big bloom. But roses in a garden don't require that much fertilizer. I use a very mild organic fertilizer. Um, and if you use too much fertilizer and they push too much growth, it actually cause, calls in pests because there's all this succulent, fast growing growth. Um, so don't, you want, you want to slow and steady wins the race, you know, like the super fast is, doesn't do it. Use clean and, and sharp bypass pruners. Um, I clean mine with, a, I carry a bottle of alcohol, a spray bottle of alcohol, and I just, I clean them in between plants, not in between cuts, but in between plants. So when I move from one plant to another plant, I, I clean them. And also the other benefit of having a bottle of alcohol with you when you're pruning in the rose garden is if you get stuck by a, um, stuck by a thorn or prickle, you, you have the, you have the necessary tool to <laughs> just clean yourself as well. I, I use it a lot for that. Um, 
And then when you're pruning, you want to prune to open up the center of the plant to allow enlightened air. And again, that is specifically for the disease, right? The, the disease is the fungus. The fungus um, likes heat, humidity, and darkness. So if you allow in the light in the air, you're going to increase the um, or decrease the likelihood of having more disease in the garden. I work in the garden normally all the time and people walk past and they always want to ask me real, real quick, how do you prune a rose? And it's not hard. And so I'm just going to be like the, the 30 second pruning lesson. The first thing you do is you remove dead, dying and disease, right? From the whole plant, but you see here it's in the center of the plant. So dead, there's dead back here. There's some diseased up here. You see this was cut too short. Um, so dead, dying, and disease, you remove that first. And then you prune to an outside bud. So when, when I say that, each place here is the potential to be the next growth point, right? So if I cut here, the plant goes this way. If I cut here, the plant goes this way. You get to be the architect. You decide which direction the plant grows and you want it to grow away from the center of the plant because that's going to allow in the light and air. Many, many people who, are, who read about pruning roses, they hear this thing about cutting on an angle or they knew they heard somewhere about cutting on an angle. There is a time to cut on an angle and that is when you have cut flowers that you got from the florist you cut on an angle to increase the surface area and it, and it kind of allows it to take up water. But in the garden, increasing the surface area of a wound is not a great idea. You want to have, you don't, a slight, the only reason that you would have the angle is that you don't want to tilt toward, you don't want to tilt the cut towards the bud because that would mean water would shed towards the bud. So you just want water to shed away from the bud, not a deep cut, just a shallow cut. And you, and here's why you can see this, this is why you want sharp clean up so you don't have these great edges. And also like, like when do you prune? For here in the Washington DC area, zone seven, what I do is I, so I prune in thirds. So in the fall, I take away about a third of the plant. So if this is the plant, take away about a third of the plant, leaving this. And the reason you do that is to, decrease the likelihood of damage from the weight of snow or in the fall it's very windy and um, they whip all this would whip around um, and scratch each other up which would then allow there would be wounds for disease to enter right so I, I remove about a third of the plant in the fall and then in the spring is when I um, butcher I mean prune, <laughs> prune them and I cut out I open up the center of the plant I choose the outside buds. I, if you have competing canes, ones that are next to each other, you choose the best one. And the best one is, is often, like the woodier they get, the less, um, the less uh, new growth you're gonna get on it. So if you're choosing between an uh, old cane and a newer cane, a newer healthy cane, you choose the newer healthy cane because you're gonna get more activity in that cane. Once they start to get woody, the bud break is, is less. So in, in summary, you can have roses in an earth-friendly garden. Um, and you do that by choosing your plants wisely and choosing disease-resistant variety. I didn't mention, I have not sprayed fungicide. There, there have been no fungicides sprayed in the Folger Rose Garden. And it doesn't, there's, there's nothing embarrassing about how that garden looks. It, no one would walk through and say, oh, you need to do something about this. It looks great. Most of the roses that were chosen for the disease resistance are doing, doing their job. There are a couple that I, I got my eye on, um, but it's it's working. Choosing the disease resistant varieties is working, um, and I I meant to mention that this wasn't going to be a talk about um, using pesticides, organic or otherwise, because that's not my area of expertise. What I wanted to do to show you was a way to not need to do those things. Um, uh, creating a garden with a variety of plants gets you a variety of insects and that variety of insects. What you want to have is a balance. You need to have both. You need to have some pests 
and the beneficial insects, because if you don't have some pests, then the beneficial insects don't have anything to eat. So you want to have a balance. And it's, it's all about like how many insects, like you don't need, if you see one bad insect, that doesn't require any kind of action on your part. It's when they reduce the display to the point uh, uh, that, that the plant's health is, a, is an issue. That's when you might consider an intervention. Um, also practicing good garden sanitation. Also monitoring for your pests. Do that for sure, because if you, need to, if you do need to do something, you, the earlier the better, I guess. Um, practice good um, garden sanitation, water, but not too much. Um, get your soil tested. Don't over when you decide fertilizers, you should be doing that kind of based on your soil test. So get your soil tested, don't over fertilize and prune for air circulation. And that, that business about have your cake and it too, it's a piece of cake. And I want you all to know that if you haven't been recently to the Folger Rose Garden, or if you've never been to the Folger Rose Garden, you're, you're invited. And then I guess Cindy may come back on and open this up for questions. I'd rather sit here and smell the roses. Thank you, Shelly. I can almost smell them. Thank you for the invitation because it's true. If you've never been surrounded by that much fragrance, it lifts your spirit for sure. So thank you. If you'd stop screen sharing, we can go ahead and we'll answer uh, some of these questions. There are more than probably we can answer right now. And one I just want you to keep in mind, but I think we should put it to on our resource page on our website, is your top 10 roses, your top 10 favorites. And I don't want to be that's like trying to decide what my top 10 foods are. That would be a question that would perplex me. So think about it and we will uh, put it up there when we uh, put up at the resource page on the website. But in the meantime, do you know of any salt resistant roses other than Rosa Ragusa? Ooh, that, was, that was the one I was going to say. Sorry. Wow. You know as much as I do on the salt, on the salt topic. <laughs> okay. I, I lived in Virginia Beach for a while, and those were all the roses that I saw everywhere were the Rosa Ragusa. Uh, and I love them so much. Me too. Wonderful fragrance, beautiful hips. I love them. Um, me too. But that's the only one that I know the salt. Okay. If we find anything, we'll stick it on our website too. And I just want to reiterate, somebody just put in, are the gardens open right now? Yes, the gardens are open right now. Please come down and be embraced by our beauty and it'll help lift your spirits for uh, the time that we're going through right now. So that's a good thing. This is a fun one. I, I commented on it. Where is your virtual background? Where did you get that? That is that such a fun image. Oh, I, you know, I just looked up like wallpaper with roses on it. So okay. No, no, nothing special. I mean, it is special, but I'm sorry I can't tell you. Gosh, I should have thought about that in advance. <laughs> okay. It's a fun one. I like it when you walk in and out. It looks like you're going through the field of roses. So it's a fun one to have. Is plum perfect fragrant? I, I know you mentioned other ones were. Is that one a fragrant rose? Yeah, it's moderate. It's moderately fragrant. If you fragrant, you put your, if you smell it, you will smell it. When you walk by it, you won't smell it. Some roses, when you walk by, you're like, oh, mm -hmm. um, moderately fragrant. Okay, and it's a beautiful color. So you can tell by my shirt, I love purple. So I might have to find a spot. I love that you said that uh, you cut, you prune back some of the roses in the fall. I do that because my roses are right in front of my window, uh, my kitchen window, and that's where I hang up Christmas decorations or holiday decorations. And so I have to do it. Otherwise, I get jabbed the whole time I'm hanging lights on my window. So that was a very good tip. But for the second pruning, do we do that now in the Washington DC area? Or are you waiting? What's your clue to start the second pruning? Oh, thank you. So the one in the fall, it, it the, what begins of the first pruning. I, mm -hmm. I like to do that here after Thanksgiving because I like to brag I had roses through Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, so after Thanksgiving is when I do that first one. And then the second one, which is the real spring pruning by in this area by St. Patrick's Day. Okay. It's like just a nice, I think is an easy way to remember versus like mid-March, okay? Mm -hmm. I, there are environmental factors that you wanna consider 
is if we're going to have extended cold periods, you don't want to have you don't want to have just pruned because when you prune, you encourage new growth. Mm -hmm, so if you pop mm -hmm. out there on the first warm day in February and you're like, I'm going to prune my roses, you prune them, and then March comes, they start growing, and then we have an extended cold snap of like you know 20 degrees weather. Those buds that you chose, that outside bud that you chose, gets frozen back. And then the next bud will then be the one that grows, which inevitably is going in the wrong direction, right? right. So you want to wait till after the uh, period of, of extended cold is over, which in our area, generally mid-March, like a single day of cold probably wouldn't do it. It kind of needs to be mm -hmm. extended by a couple of days of cold that's going to get it back. But I, I always say, you know, you want to try to get it done by St. Patrick's Day. And then there I am at, you know, after St. Patrick's Day still pruning because there are about 300 roses in the rose garden, which is not huge, but it's still, it's still a fair amount of roses depending upon how much time you spend on each rose. And I have vicious and slow pruning. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. So St. Patrick's Day, you prune your roses and you plant your potatoes. Because uh, I use that date to pen, unless of course there's snow on the ground and then I'm not going to plant potatoes. So that's good. So your Plum Perfect was just a beautiful example of opening up the rose. How low did you cut that down so that it would be opened up? I know you chose the picture, but it's hard to tell in the image how far down you actually cut. Generally speaking, when you prune a rose, and it you know it varies. If you're, we're not I'm not talking about shrub rose right now. So generally speaking, you want to leave 18 to 24 inches okay. when you're done, right? And I say that, and I try really hard to leave that. But again, when you're cut, when you, if you have an older rose and you cut out dead, dying, and disease first, mm -hmm. and it doesn't leave that much, that's okay. You know, like they they will come back. I have left, you know less than a foot. I've left six inches in some cases and I still have, a, they grow so much in a single season that I'm not afraid that my pruning them in, in the early spring is going to, is going to kill it. No. And it, and I'm also not afraid it's going to reduce the display. I just, it's your opportunity to create a plant that doesn't need to be sprayed. Right. And you can also throughout the season continue, like if it, you know, blooms and flowers and that, um, flower or a cane is coming from the middle, you can cut it out then too, you know, um, just know why you're doing the pruning, you know, you know that you're doing it to reduce the incidence of disease by allowing in light and air. And when you know that's why you're doing it, and don't get hung up on, um, you know, don't, it, you're not going to hurt it. They're so, they're so resilient, and they grow so much in a single season. So I, I you know, be, be confident um, and brave when you're putting your roses. Just like you, Shelly, confident and brave. Thank you. That was a very good way to explain it because you're right. They, they seem to survive just fine. I can be a witness to how deep you prune some of those roses and they always come back beautifully. Now, I don't remember seeing any climbing roses in the garden. Do you have any climbing roses that you know that are more disease resistant? I do have some climbing roses. I haven't managed to get them climbing yet. Um, okay. But I can, I have on good authority that Laguna, which is a climbing rose, um, a friend of mine grows that and she sings its praises. It's a dark pink. And that's the one that I have in the um, Folger Rose Garden. It's a dark pink flower. It's really beautiful. Okay, I have to remember that because I was looking for a climbing rose too. That would be terrific to include. Um, I know we, because we're a federal uh, entity, we can't recommend specific sites or specific companies, but do you have a way that a person could really research information on uh, where we can find some of these roses? Is there anything that would help someone? Um, I, again, I, I think the best place to find roses that ha are showing disease resistance, you are going to go to your public garden, you're going to go to your local rose society and find out from them. Websites, um, growers, they, they will tell you what the disease resistance is, but they don't know it specifically for your area. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of books. Um, there's like 150 chemical-free 
Roses, that, that by Peter Kukowski. That's a book that's out there. That's a book that I use. So mm -hmm. um, I'd recommend that as a great resource. That's terrific. And if you've talked to someone in your local area and you find the rose that you they highly recommend that you really would want your garden to, I guess that's the hard part. Where do you find it? So perhaps when you're talking to that person in the garden, they'll share the information with you. But it's not something that we can put out on our website to recommend uh, different sites that you can purchase the ro roses at. So we apologize for that, but it, it's just the situation that we're in. Uh, that being if I could just say that I do buy all of the roses online because that allows me the opportunity, affords me the opportunity to choose the specific rose that I want, the rose that I have done research on versus if I go to a, the local garden center, I can't, I, I then, then I'm going to impulse buy, right? <laughs> when I impulse buy, like I have a, a rose in the a miniature in the rose garden that is um, called Magic Carousel. Mm -hmm. I have it because the garden, the Folger Rose Garden, is directly across Jefferson Drive from the um, the National Mall's carousel, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> carousel that's on the National Mall. And I was like, oh, isn't that clever? I'll have a little rose next to the carousel. <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. disease resistant for four, even. <laughs> and I, that impulse buys don't get you a, um, a, disease-free garden, right? It, mm -hmm. it gets you a it gets you a nice story to tell, but it doesn't get you it doesn't get you to the ultimate goal, which is a rose garden where you can just enjoy the roses and literally smell them and not have to worry about the fact that they have maybe been sprayed. Yeah, that's true. Would you go to the American Rose Society? Do they have any lists uh, of places that you could you could buy? Because we're big fans of societies. They uh, help you out quite a bit. I'm sure they must have a list on the website. Okay, we will check that out. Um, how about knockout roses? They were, I mean, it, when they first came out, it was almost like the answer to our prayers. But what do you feel about knockout roses? I mean, knockout roses were, were um, you know, they're sort of for they're low maintenance uh, guard, flowering shrub, right? That's, that's how they're used. Um, and I don't have any in the Folger Rose Garden. I mean, they were an innovation in roses, right? But I don't have them in the Folger Rose Garden because they're everywhere. I mean, they, you don't need to come to a rose garden to see a knockout rose. That is they, true. They are in low maintenance areas. So they're not getting as much attention as roses that would be in your, in your garden proper or in my garden. And because of that, I'm seeing a lot of that uh, rose rosette disease on the knockouts. It's not because it's more attractive than knockouts. It's just that knockouts are in areas where people aren't fussing it, right? So they're kind of becoming this um, kind of pool of, of, of rose rosette. So they're maybe getting a bad name because of that. But I mean, I, I, there isn't anything I don't dislike roses, right? I don't like roses, even knockouts. I mean, I like them. I like them all. And I feel like there, for every garden situation, maybe even for every gardener, there's probably a rose that would be great in your garden for one thing or another. You know, um, Lady Banks is, like if you, maybe if you only had one rose, you know, and you had this, this Lady Banks is a climbing rose. Um, it only blooms once, but when it does, wow. And it's so, so big. Like if you need to cover up a barn, you know, there's a, castle. a rose. <laughs> a barn or a castle. There's a rose that, that will do that for you. Or if you want a teeny little thing, there's a rose, there's a rose for that too. There's, um, yeah, I like them. <laughs> All of them. Beautifully <laughs> said, beautifully said. A good point about knockout roses. It's not the fault of the rose. It's the fault of where we put the rose and how we maintain the rose. So consider that uh, when you're doing it. Um, so you were talking about size. There's a, a rose for everything. How, what size is a miniature rose? When you're like a dwarf conifer is dwarf compared to the species, but is it dwarf? No. How about a miniature rose? Well, miniature rose have they have smaller flowers, or so the, the flower itself is is smaller, like one two inches, uh, and then the plant one to two feet. You know, it's uh, again, you know, 
like the drift roses, I think they, they crossed it. That was a cross with a miniature rose to get that, that petite, that petite oh. back. So okay. it's like a dwarf conifer, but they seem somehow seem different. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like, really, I mean, oh, well, it is. It's just like a smaller, smaller, the miniature. <laughs> okay, they're miniature. So the, the roses themselves are miniature, not necessarily the the plant that they're on, but the plant could be miniature too. No, the plant is smaller too. The okay. plant is smaller too. Okay. But that picture I showed of Roxy didn't give you a good scale. You know, like miniatures are going to be below your knee. Right? Oh, okay. Too little. And then they also have a smaller flower. Okay, very good to know. So what about the catmint? The catmint Montrose white is beautiful. The calamintha. It, or, or is there a secret to finding that plant? Is it something you, again, should look in your local area or, or talk to your local growers? Thank you for that question. Um, I normally remember to mention this. Montrose white is a sterile cultivar of, of calamintha. There's another one called white cloud. That, that's, that seeds around, which I had in the, in the previous iteration of the Rose Garden. Um, and I loved it, which is why I got more Calamintha. Um, but this time I chose Montrose White so I could reduce the amount of um, weeding of the seedlings. Mm -hmm. But I have found this trickier to find Montrose White lately. Um, and if I couldn't find Montrose White, I would still get White Cloud. I would still get it and just pull those um, minty smelling seedlings. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, I, will, I, I think Calamenta is widely available. I'm just not sure how, I, I haven't looked this year, but I did look last year, how easy it is to find Montrose White. Um, okay. But honestly, I haven't looked recently. So, but that's, that's a good Montrose tip. White is a sterile cultivar, so it doesn't do. Okay. So white cloud, if you can't find Montrose White, that's a very good tip. Thank you. This one's going to make you laugh. Are there any roses that you can grow in full shade? You, you mentioned a couple that were part shade and we'll have that on our resource page. Are there any full shade roses that you know of? The ones that I mentioned are the only ones that I've grown. And I have, what I have in that area is bright indirect light. Okay. So it, while it does stay in the shade of the building the whole day, it has bright indirect light. And shade is such a tricky thing because mm. when some, someone says full shade, I'm like, is it dark in the middle of the woods? Is it, you know, like, it, they, you know, they say roses need six hours of sunlight. Um, and if you go down to four, what does that mean? And if it's full shade, does that mean you're not getting any sunlight? And is, it, is there any indirect light coming in? I think it's very tricky. Person who has, uh, has, Deep shade, maybe be the person to tell me if they have roses will grow in it. I don't have deep shade. I have bright indoor. It isn't. It isn't shade of the building the entire day, but it is there's bright indirect light. Okay. When I moved into my house and we had lived here for thirty years now, the only thing that was in my backyard was a small boxwood, a rose plant, and mulch underneath a deck that was in full shade. The boxwood was okay. The rose never bloomed. So if you can imagine that deep a shade, we pulled it out. Uh, one of the people have, have, one of the audience has said, Zephyrine, and I've got to mispronounce, Zephyrine. Zephyrine Thank you. Zephyrine. So that is one that is being recommended for full shade. So you can try that one and see. But Shelly, thank you so much. You're delight to have on with us today. Your knowledge is wonderful and you, the way that you present it makes it very easy to understand. We appreciate your professionalism and your answers. And we're still gonna put up those top 10 favorite roses, but you're gonna have to go on our website because like I said, Shelly's gonna have to think about that for a while, but we will put up an answer for her top 10 roses as well as many other roses that she grows in the Smithsonian Gardens, uh, Catherine Dulger Folger, Rose Garden. And I know I mispronounced that, but thank you. And we will see you all next week. We hope uh, we have another exciting uh, class on trees. 
and pruning and mulching. And this is the time of the year you're gonna see people start to mulch. So it's good to come and learn the proper way to mulch and the proper way uh, to look at growth from the bottom. Thank you all. We'll see you next time. Thank Bye. You. Thank you, Shelley.